So, welcome to uh, Paris Peking Tokyo seminar. So, it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, speaker, the first speaker on this Zoom session today. So, <clears throat> the speaker is Art Seju Lubra. Uh, so, he will tell us prismatic dual theory. So, please start. Okay, well, hello everyone. And, uh, well, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak and for setting up everything in this uh, very particular context. So uh, my talk of today is about prismatic Dodone theory. And uh, so everything I will discuss is a joint work with Johannes Anschutz. And uh, for all this talk, I will fix a prime number P once and for all. So uh, the goal of our work was to, to prove some classification results for p groups over various, various kinds of, of rings. And uh, the main tool we used to do this is a recent theory of prisms on prismatic cohomology, which has been developed by Bat and Scholze. So the plan of my talk will be the following. I will first spend some time, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, to discuss a little bit prisms on prismatic cohomology. So recall the basic definitions and, and constructions. And then I will start uh, speaking about the uh, joint work with Uranus. Uh, so first of all, I need to tell you about which kind of rings we want to classify peaceable groups. And these rings are called quasi-symptomic rings. So this is what I will do next. I will uh, explain the definition of these rings. Then I need to tell you by which kind of objects we, we classify peaceable groups over such rings, and uh, we call them filtered prismatic geodonic crystals. So I will uh, explain the definition and some basic properties of these objects. And then finally, I will uh, explain our main results and say a few words about uh, the proofs and some corollaries of these of this results. Okay. So let me start with uh, prisms and prismatic cohomology. And uh, I should make it clear, like everything in this part is, uh, is due to Bat and Scholze. So uh, the theory of prismatic cohomology relies on two important basic definitions, the notion of a delta ring and the notion of a prism. So let me start with delta rings. So I will assume always that my rings lives over Z uh, localized away from P. And then the delta ring will be uh, a commutative ring A together with a map of sets, just of sets, uh, delta, which goes from A to A, and uh, which has the following properties. So first of all, it maps 0 and 1 to 0. And then uh, you want to prescribe how delta behaves with respect to uh, multiplication and addition. And this is given by these two uh, formulas, which may uh, look a bit strange uh, the first time you see them. So uh, delta of a product, if x, y, for all x, y in A, is uh, x to the p delta y plus y to the p delta x plus p times the product of delta x by delta y. And then you have a similar formula for the addition. So delta of the sum, x plus y, is just delta of x plus delta of y, and then you need to correct it by this this term here. And uh, so observe that uh, if you use a binomial formula to expand this uh, x plus y to the p, then all the terms except x, p, and y to the p, which are canceled here, uh, are actually divisible by p. So this expression makes sense in any ring. Uh, you don't need to, to assume that the ring is p torsion free or anything like this. OK. So this is what the delta ring is. So the ring A together with a map of sets uh, satisfying these this three properties. So uh, if one has a delta ring, uh, A delta, so uh, you, you can do the following operation. So you can define the map phi, which goes from A to A, and which sends x to x to the p plus p times delta x. And then you check an exercise that the identity is satisfied by delta, which I had before over there, are actually exactly what you need to check that this uh, map phi, a priori um, just a map of sets from A to A, is actually a ring morphism. 
And moreover, uh, just by definition, it's uh, a lift of Frobenius. So if you kill P, then uh, these terms disappears and uh, it just becomes X, go, it just becomes a Frobenius. X goes to X to the P. And uh, conversely, assume you start with a ring, a commutative ring A together with a ring morphism phi, which lifts Frobenius modulo P. Then if you assume that the ring you have is P torsion free, you can actually uh, just uh, like uh, divide phi x minus x to the p by p and uh, define this way a delta structure on your ring. So in other words, in, in first approximation, you can think to delta rings as rings together with a lift, uh, with a ring morphism which lifts uh, Frobenius, right? But, but the two notions are, are not exactly the same thing when, the, when you have p torsion in your ring. Okay, uh, another point of view, which I just want to mention uh, about delta structures is uh, the following. So if you have a ring A, uh, then uh, giving yourself a delta structure on A is in fact the same thing as uh, specifying a ring morphism from A to the uh, ring of uh, length two bit vectors over A, which uh, will be a section of the natural projection on the first component. And the recipe for this is assume you start with a delta structure, <coughs> delta on your ring A. Then you just look at the map uh, from A to W2 of A, which sends X to X comma delta X. And once again, you can check that the axioms about delta, which tells you that uh, you have a delta ring, is exactly what you need uh, to verify that this is a, a ring morphism. Okay, and, and this, is, this point of view is useful because it allows you to prove that this category of delta rings, contrary to the category of rings with a lift of Frobenius, has all limits and colimits, which you can just compute on underlying rings. And uh, so in particular, this functor, forgetful functor from delta rings to rings, will have both the left and the right adjoint. And the right adjoint is uh, given by the bit vectors functor. Okay, so uh, that's the first remark. And then another remark, which is more an exercise that you can, that you can do. Uh, I said that, I mean, th th there are examples of delta rings with, with p-torsion, but uh, it can never happen that you have a delta ring in which uh, p to the n is zero for, for some a. Okay, this is something you can check just using the definition of a delta ring. Okay, very good. So we will see uh, some examples later. Oh, wait a second. Uh, yes. Uh, no, it's a trivial uh, remark that zero is a delta ring, so p to the n. Yeah, okay, I assume that zero is different from one, but okay, yeah, if you want. But no, but if you want all limits and co-limits, then maybe- ah, Okay, you... okay, yeah. Then I should have said that uh, uh, no, yeah, there is no non-zero delta ring in which uh, p to the n can be zero. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so as I said, we'll see an example soon, but uh, now I'll come to the next uh, definition, namely the definition of a prism. So uh, what is a prism? It's just a pair, A comma I, where A is a delta ring. So usually in the notation, I will just forget the delta. Okay, I'll just say A is a delta ring without mentioning delta in simplicity. So you have a delta ring A, and then you have some ideal I inside A. And uh, again, this pair has to satisfy some properties. So first of all, you require that I uh, defines a Carty divisor on spec A. So it's just like uh, locally principal generated by a non-zero divisor. Uh, then uh, you also require that I is periodically complete. And uh, for technical reasons, uh, you should mean this in the derived sense. Also, uh, soon we will make some assumption on the ring, which uh, ensures that in practice, uh, like the derived and the classical uh, completions agree. So first approximation, you can just uh, think that this is classically periodically complete. 
And then the last condition, the, the most important one. Uh, so I has to be uh, a prosa risky locally generated by a distinguished element. And what is a distinguished element? By definition, it's just an element a D, which has the property that delta of D is a unit. Okay, and once again, in practice, uh, I will always be principal. So you should just remember that a, a prism is a pair A comma I, where A is data ring, and let's say I is principal generated by a non-zero divisor, which is distinguished in the sense that its image by delta is a unit. And moreover, the ring should be uh, PI identically complete. Okay. I mean, the important condition is, is, is the last one. Uh, and so now I can give two examples of, of such uh, prisms. So first of all, okay, if you have a P complete and P torsion free delta ring A, then the pair formed by A and the ideal generated by P is a prism. Okay, so I mean, I remember, so you need to, to check three conditions. So first of all, I had assumed that uh, P is, uh, there is no P torsion, so P is non-zero divisor. Then uh, by assumption, I also require that my ring is, is P complete. In this case, uh, I is just P. And finally, the only thing you have to check is actually that delta of P is always a unit. Okay, and this, I mean, this is also what you need to, to do this little exercise I, I gave before that uh, it cannot happen that P to the N is zero. I mean, the, the way to prove this is just to check that delta P has to be a unit in, in any delta. Okay, so that's one first class of example. Uh, and now here is another uh, interesting example of, of prisms. So let me give one more definition first. So we will say that a prism is perfect if uh, it's Frobenius phi. So remember, whenever you have a prism, uh, sorry, a delta ring, you have this delta, then you can define a phi, which leaves Frobenius by the formula that phi to the x is x to the p plus p times delta x. So what you require is that this ring morphism phi is uh, actually an isomorphism. Okay. And then uh, the claim is that actually the category of perfect prisms is the same as the category of integral uh, perfect weight rings. Uh, and uh, how do you see that? Well, I mean, you, you can define uh, functors in both directions, which are uh, quasi inverse of each other. And uh, let me tell you how. So in one direction, assume you start with an integral perfect weight ring, R. Uh, then you can do this classical uh, Fontaine's construction. Uh, you can consider a inf of R. So what you do is first you, you tilt uh, your uh, perfect weight ring. So you get a perfect ring of characteristic P, R flat. And then you take its ring of bit vectors. This is what is called A inf of R. And uh, A inf of R comes with a natural map theta, which goes from, from it towards R. And uh, I mean, part of the definition of, or at least co consequence of the definition of an integral perfect weight ring is that this will be a principal generated by a non-zero divisor. And you check that, in fact, this uh, generator, which is usually denoted by Xi in periodic Hodge theory, uh, is in fact uh, distinguished in the previous sense. So namely, uh, ah, sorry, I, I should have said first that, okay, this ring is P torsion free, uh, R flat being perfect. And so it has, it comes with a natural Frobenius and uh, you just take the delta structure attached to this, uh, to this uh, Frobenius leaf. And then my claim was that the generator of this ideal is actually distinguished. And uh, well, the way, you, I mean, you, you can check this by proving more generally that in such a, a delta ring, uh, in the delta ring of this form, bit vectors of some perfect ring, uh, an element is uh, distinguished if and only if it is primitive of degree, or of degree one, which means that when you write the expansions of as a sum of uh, Teichmuller's times powers of P, then the coefficient of P has to be a unit. And this you can check for Foxa. Okay, uh, so this is one, one functor. And then if you want to go in the other direction, 
it's even more simple. You just mod out, uh, you have a prism AI, which is assumed to be perfect. And then you just uh, look at A mod I. Uh, how okay, do you recover delta? How do we get delta? Yeah. Well, okay, I said that uh, if the ring is p-torsion free, which is mm. the case for this ring A inf of R, then uh, oh. having a delta structure is the same as having a Frobenius field. Mm -hmm. And you have a Frobenius on the ring of bit vector oh. of R. So you just take the delta structure attached to this, to this Frobenius. Okay, and so this, uh, this proposition is, uh, I mean, this example is the reason why uh, I guess Batten should also like, describe prisms as some kind of deperfection of the category of perfected rings. Because you see that inside the category of all prisms, I have this uh, subcategory formed by perfect prisms, and these are exactly the same thing as uh, perfected rings. And I is like, choosing I, my ideal is be uh, like it's the same as choosing some untilt of my uh, of the of the tilt of of my perfect ring. Okay. Okay. So once you have done this, uh, namely introduce uh, delta rings and, and prisms, uh, you can define the prismatic side. And there are several versions of it. So uh, for us, the one which is uh, really relevant is. Uh, the absolute version. So let's start with R. Ah, there's a question. Uh -huh. Could you un unmute the, the you person who asked a question? Yeah, I, I did not hear anything. Takeshi, could you unmute the, the person who asked the question? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to do that, but it doesn't work. Yeah, maybe... Yeah, there, there's a question on the, on the microphone. Uh, there is a problem on the microphone. I, 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 yeah, I cannot do. Okay, so maybe he can ask his question by uh, chat, okay? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so uh, I define now the, the absolute prismatic side. So let me uh, fix a ring R, which is assumed to be periodically complete. Uh, then the absolute prismatic side of uh, the ring R, which will be denoted by R prism. Okay, so this symbol is supposed to be a prism, even if it appears as a delta here. Uh, so as a category, it's just the opposite of the category of all uh, bounded prisms, Bj, uh, together with a, a ring map from R to B mod J. Okay, so uh, here there is one adjective which I did not define yet, uh, bounded. So, it's just, again, a technical condition about which you can forget in first approximation. Uh, it's telling you that uh, you have your prism BJ and uh, what you require is that B mod J uh, here has a bounded P infinity torsion. And this just means that uh, if uh, there exists some integer N big enough, such that any element which is killed by a power of P in this ring P mod J is actually already killed by p to the n. And this is a condition you put for technical reasons which have to do with, uh, with derived versus classical completions. Uh, okay, but I mean, basically an object of the site is a prism with a map from R to uh, its reduction B modulo J. And then you put a topology on this uh, category. So uh, you define covers uh, to be morphism of prisms Bj goes to uh, B prime J prime. So a morphism of prism is uh, the obvious notion. So it's just a morphism of delta rings compatible with a delta structure, which sends uh, J into J prime. And uh, you say it will be a cover if uh, when you just look at the underlying ring map, 
from B to B prime, it's uh, PJ completely faithfully flat. So this means that uh, if I take the derived tensor product of B prime uh, with B modulo PJ over B, uh, I mean, first of all, it has to be concentrated in degree zero, and it, it is then uh, faithfully flat over B modulo PJ in the usual sense. So it's just a slightly weaker notion that the notion of faithfully flat ring morphism. Uh, Someone would just require a condition modulo PJ uh, for the reason that, again, everything is assumed to be complete and uh, you want a notion which is stable under completion. So instead of looking at faithfully flat morphism, you, you just look at PJ completely faithfully flat morphism. Oh. Yes. Oh, there's a question. So okay. Please. Okay, so first, uh, uh, for the prism, there are several technical. So in the morphism of prism, you require that J goes to J prime, but I suppose it, fo it should follow that J generates J prime. Is it correct? Yeah, this is true. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, also, you need to have a finite uh, disjoint unions of, uh, I mean, when you have the topology also wants a risky covering of, of this N, uh, like N opens. Ah, so uh, here you just have covering by one thing. Of course, you have you need to add the, like the disjoint union of N uh, level the, or the couple. Well, if B is a product of situations, then it's a, taking all of them will be a covering by N things. Okay, so yeah, I agree. Okay, so it should just be generated by this this covers. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, no, no other question. Uh, okay, uh, so this is a notion, the definition of the prismatic side. <coughs> and then you have two natural uh, pre-shifts on this side. So uh, one is denoted, is, uh, denoted by O prism and the other one is uh, denoted by O prism bar. And uh, these are the functor which uh, define on the prismatic side, which send uh, uh, a prism BJ uh, on the prismatic side to B. So this is for, for O prism. And O prism bar will send uh, BJ to B mod J. And uh, something bad should also check is that uh, these two functors are actually shifts on this prismatic side. And um, uh, they both have a name. So uh, this shift O prism will be uh, just called the prismatic structure shift. And uh, the other one, O prism bar, is called the reduced prismatic structure shift. Okay, and then, I mean, okay, something you can deduce from this is that uh, you can also, you could also consider the, the functor I prism, which sends just PJ to J itself. And then you, you, this is also a shift on this side. Okay. So you have these two shifts, I mean, these three shifts on this prismatic side. And this is the ones we, we will use uh, later on. But uh, before doing that, I want to uh, mention that, okay, in, I define the absolute version of the prismatic side. You could also do the following. So let, let me fix, to start with, a bounded prism A comma I. And then I require that my ring R is living over AI. So R is a P-complete A mod I algebra. And then you can define a variant of the uh, absolute prismatic side where everything lives over A. Mm -hmm. So it will be denoted by uh, R over A prism. And uh, it will be the category of all prism BJ, uh, which live over AI. So together with a map of prisms from AI to BJ. And uh, as before, uh, you want that uh, B mod J receives a ring morphism from R, which now is required to be uh, a morphism of A mod I algebra. So everything lives over my uh, bounded prism AI, which I fix at the beginning. And the topology is as before. And uh, this is uh, the, the version that uh, Batch also use. And what they do, I mean, one of the main uh, objectives of their paper is to compare uh, what you get using this notion with uh, other uh, uh, classical, more classical periodic cohomology series. And 
so to do that, you, you, I mean, once you have defined this site, you can define prismatic cohomology. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I keep the same notation as before. So AI is my fixed prism and R is living over A mod I. And then the prismatic cohomology of R over A, which will be denoted by prism of R over A, is uh, simply the cohomology of my sheaf or prism on this relative prismatic site R over A prism. And well, actually, uh, to be more precise, you only make this definition when R is assumed to be a formally smooth over A mod I. You could do it always, but uh, it's not well behaved and uh, the way batch also defined prismatic cohomology for uh, general uh, a mod i algebra is uh, using left can extension from the smooth case in the same way as you you would define the cotangent complex from the shift of, of degree one differentials in general <clears throat> but at least when when everything is smooth then uh, the definition is just uh, the cohomology of the shift on this side and as I said, uh, what Batch also do is they compare this uh, new cohomology theory with uh, other periodic cohomology theories. And I just want to mention two comparison results they prove. There are many of them. Uh, namely the Hodge state and the crystalline comparison theorems. So for this, okay, so I recall notation, AI is fixed prism, which is assumed to be bounded, and R is formally smooth over A mod I. Okay, so the first result is the Hodge state comparison. So it tells you that, I mean, let me start with uh, the right hand side. So here you have uh, my, your prismatic cohomology complex, which I defined before, prism R mod A, and you take its derived tensor product with A mod I over A. So it would be the same as uh, considering the, the cohomology on the prismatic side of my reduced prismatic structure shift or prism bar. And I consider cohomology of this in some degree i. And then the claim is that this is canon canonically isomorphic as an R module uh, with uh, the module of uh, degree i differential forms on uh, R over A mod i. And here, I mean, it's implicitly assumed to be periodically completed. Uh, up to some small twist, which is denoted by this symbol with an i. Uh, it's a Broekissian kind of twist, so uh, I recall the notation below. Uh, if you have some a mod i module m, uh, you will denote by m twisted by i the tensor product of uh, m with uh, i mod i square i times uh, over a mod i. Okay, so this is a rather surprising result when you think a little bit about it, because I mean, you, you have made this definition of prismatic cohomology just using uh, delta rings on, on prisms. And you see that naturally when you compute it, I mean, when you compute the reduced prismatic cohomology, the cohomology groups of this complex, then you see uh, differential forms uh, showing up. So. Okay, and uh, as a remark, I said oh, before that there's a question. Yes. So uh, the, you didn't define what is P completely smooth. I imagine that completions of smooth things or direct limits, filtered limits of those are, are P completely smooth, but what is the exact definition? Uh, so I would say that um, if I have a map A to B, uh, I would say it's P completely smooth if uh, the, uh, I take the derived answer product of uh, B with A mod P over A, and I require this to be sitting in degree zero and being smooth uh, over A mod P. In the classical finite type sense? Uh, yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other question? Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay, that uh, a remark that I, I said before, if you want to define prismatic cohomology in general, you, you, you don't do it just by computing cohomology of the structure shift on the prismatic side. You do this process of left can extension. But once you have done this, 
I don't want to, to, to explain it in detail, but uh, you can check that uh, this Hodge state comparison result will actually generalize as follows. Uh, namely, uh, if you have some A mod I algebra, R, P complete, but not necessarily smooth, then uh, it's a reduced prismatic cohomology, so this complex over there, uh, the base change to A mod I of prismatic cohomology. It actually comes equipped with a natural filtration, which is increasing, and uh, which has the property that the graded pieces of this filtration, which is called the conjugate filtration, uh, are given just by wedge powers of the cotangent complex of R over A mod I, and suitably shifted uh, and uh, brachism twisted and periodically completed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, this is something you can directly deduced from the definition, from the previous Hodge-Tech comparison plus uh, the definition of both sides in general. But I wanted to point this out because uh, when, I mean, we will see the cotangent complex appearing uh, later once, later again. And uh, basically the moral, what you can remember from this statement is that uh, Hodge-Tech comparison gives you a way to like have some control on prismatic cohomology or at least it's reduction modulo i uh, in terms of the cotangent complex. So if you have some information of, on the cotangent complex, you can usually deduce some interesting properties of uh, prismatic cohomology. Okay, and then uh, the next statement is uh, the so-called crystalline comparison. Uh, so this is a case where you assume that uh, in your fixed prism AI, uh, I is generated by P. Uh, okay, then in particular, because R lives over A mod I, it means that uh, P is zero in your ring R. And, uh, then you could ask the question, how does this prismatic cohomology relate to uh, another interesting crystal uh, cohomology theory in, in, in characteristic P, uh, namely crystalline cohomology? And the answer is that uh, uh, actually they are almost the same. So if you compute crystalline cohomology of R over A, uh, then, well, it is the same as uh, prismatic cohomology, except that here on the right hand side, uh, you have to twist by Frobenius. So you take pullback along the Frobenius of A. Okay, so in particular, if you know what prismatic cohomology looks like, you recover crystalline cohomology. You cannot necessarily go the other way because A is not assumed to be perfect. So phi of A is not necessarily an isomorphism. But at least if you know prismatic cohomology, you, you, you recover crystalline cohomology. And, and this is compatible with, the, with the, the Frobenius structure on both sides. And this is also quite surprising because this way you get a definition of crystalline cohomology without using uh, divided powers and anything like that. And, and, and the key technical statement to check this is uh, a funny exercise that if you have a a P torsion free delta ring. And uh, if you have some element in this delta ring, such that its first divided power is in your ring, then actually all the other divided powers are also in the ring. This is something you can check using the existence of the delta structure in your ring. And I'm, this, this is one of the key inputs to in the, in the proof of this uh, crystalline comparison theory. Okay. Ah, there's a question. Yes. So uh, just a clarification in the theorem, you wrote phi A upper star, the kind of pullback, but since you're always working the derived, the complete things, is, it, is there some completion there or, or is just algebraic? Uh, maybe I'm confused, but. Um, wait. Uh, Uh, I'm not sure now. Uh, I don't think you need to complete, but uh, what you say is that the delta. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, no. I, as far as I understood, you characterize the your. Uh, you characterize your, your things like uh, uh, 
when the, the relation with forms is only after modding by i and also maybe p to, to p complete. So it seems that everything is in some sense derived complete relative to your ideals and so you. And when you take phi I upper star, maybe it destroys this. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm. I'm not sure. I should. I. I should check again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So. Uh, okay. So that's all I wanted to say about um, prismatic cohomology in general. Uh, now I turn to. Uh, prismatic Diodonne theory itself. So as I said, I need to explain over which rings uh, we want to classify p zero groups and by which kind of objects we want to classify them. So I start with the rings. So there will be again uh, definitions. So uh, we, uh, the rings we will consider are called quasi-symptomic. So uh, ring R is said to be quasi-symptomic if it satisfies a following condition. So first of all, it's, it's P complete. So this, this we always assume everywhere. And uh, with bounded P infinity torsion. So I recall that this just means that there exists some integer n such that everything killed by a power of P is already killed by, by P to the n. Okay. And then the really important condition in the definition is that uh, you want the cotangent complex of R over ZP to have p complete tau amplitude in degree minus one zero. So this means that uh, you take this cotangent complex and you take its derived tensor product with uh, n for any r mod p module n. And then you want that this object lives in uh, degrees minus one zero as a complex of r mod p modules. Okay, so this is a, the absolute notion somehow. And then you can also define what a quasi-symptomic morphism is. So it will be a, a morphism of, of uh, P complete with bounded P infinity torsion rings, R goes to R prime, uh, which, uh, okay, first you want that R prime is P completely flat over R. So I already explained what that means. Uh, and then uh, you want that the relative cotangent complex of R prime over R as P complete tau amplitude in uh, minus one zero. Uh, okay, and uh, you can also define what a quasi-symptomic cover is. This would be useful uh, later. Uh, it's the same definition, but instead of uh, requiring that the map is P completely flat, you want it to be P completely faithfully flat. Okay, but so, uh, yeah, the important condition is really the, the condition on the cotangent complex. And uh, this definition is due to, I mean, it appeared in the paper of uh, Bat Moreau and Scholz on topological orchid homology. And the idea is that it should extend, uh, well, in, in the world of, of periodically complete rings. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some trouble. Uh, we lost that pit speaker. Ah, yes, uh, coming back. Hello. Ah. Okay, does it work? Sorry, I think it. Yeah, now we recover the connection. Well, okay. Is it okay? Yes, uh, sorry. So is ah, it good now? Good, good. Yeah, it's good now. Okay, sorry, I think the connection. Okay, that was, I don't know. Um, okay, so I was uh, just saying that this uh, this definition is an extension of the classical notion of symptomic, uh, well, of, of LCI ring and, and symptomic morphism. But you, you don't make any Nusserian or finite lab type assumption in this definition. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, let uh, before giving examples, uh, one more piece of notation. So. Uh, I will denote the category of all quasi-symptomic rings by uh, Q sin. And uh, then you can look at the opposite category and uh, consider the topology which is defined uh, using the quasi-symptomic covers in the above sense. So as I said, like uh, 
uh, maps which are quasi symptomic and uh, which are PA completely faithfully flat. Uh, sorry, P completely faithfully flat. Okay, and uh, then as a notation, if, if R is an object of this side, I would just denote by R with uh, small letters Q sin, the subsite which is formed by all rings which are quasi symptomic over R. And again, undot with this quasi symptomic topology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I give, I give examples of, of such rings now. Uh, the first example is just to justify the, the claim before that. This, this generalizes a classical notion of LTI ring. So the claim is that any P-complete uh, Nusserian ring, which is locally complete intersection, is quasi-symptomic. And uh, well, this is checked using, I mean, actually Avramov gave a characterization of such rings, uh, LCI, in terms of the cotangent complex. Mm -hmm. But here you just need the easy direction of Avramov theorem to prove that any such ring is uh, quasi-symptomic. Okay, so that's one first class of example, but you also have like huge rings in this, uh, uh, in this category of quasi-symptomic rings. So namely, uh, I claim that any integral perfected ring is quasi-symptomic. And the reason for this is, okay, well, remember you have to, to check, okay, first of all, it's, it's periodically complete by definition. Then you can also check that for a perfected ring, uh, if there, there could be some p-torsion, but uh, like the p, the p infinity torsion is just the same as the p torsion. So the first two conditions are, are checked. And then you need to check this condition in the definition about the cotangent complex. Uh, and for this, well, you observe that uh, this map from uh, ZP, um, the canonical map from ZP to R, it actually factors through, you can factor it through uh, the theta map. So I should have written that this uh, second map here on the right is Fontaine theta map. And whenever you have such a composite, you get a triangle uh, for the cotangent complex. Uh, and now you observe that, well, what is a inf of R once you mod out P? It's just R flat, which is a perfect ring of characteristic P. And whenever you have a perfect ring of characteristic P, its cotangent complex over FP is just zero. Basic idea is just that if you take uh, any x, like it's always of the form y to the p for some y because the ring is perfect, and then dx is just like p y p minus one dy, and if p is zero, this is just zero. So this way you can check that the cotangent complex of something perfect of f p is zero, but this just tells you that uh, mod p, I mean the p completions of my cotangent complex of R over ZP and uh, the cotangent complex of R over A inf of R uh, agree, right? Because in this triangle, the, uh, the, the other term will, will, will vanish after P completion. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but so then, uh, once you know this, you can just, you are reduced to describe this cotangent complex of R over A inf of R, but then this map is uh, surjective and the kernel uh, theta is, uh, by properties of perfect rings, is principal and generated by a non-zero divisor. Mm -hmm. So this means that then the cotangent complex is just the same as R, but uh, shifted, uh, leaving in cohomological degree minus one. Okay, so th this way you check the, uh, that in fact, in this case, it, the cotangent complex even has tau amplitude in degrees minus one, minus one, it's even better. And then from these two class of examples, you can construct other examples if you want. So you can take a smooth algebra of a perfect ring and take its P completion. Or you can take a perfect, sorry, uh, yeah, take a, an integral perfect ring and just uh, uh, mod out by a finite regular sequence. So if it's again, if it is again a uh, bounded P infinity torsion, then uh, this would give you another example of quasi-symptomic rings. And here I list uh, some examples. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can take the Tate algebra in one variable over OCP. Uh, you can take OCP mod P, or you can take this characteristic P perfect ring, FP T1 over P infinity and mod out T minus one. So these are all examples of quasi-symptomic rings. 
Okay, so uh, I think that's basically all I, I wanted to say about quasi-symptomic rings. But I would just want to try to convince you that uh, many interesting examples are, of rings are actually quasi-symptomic. Okay, and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, one good point of this uh, bat moroshalter definition uh, is that it's purely a definition in terms of the cotangent complex. And we have seen before, uh, uh, this was a hot state comparison theorem, that if you have some control on the cotangent complex, uh, because of this hot state comparison, you, you can usually deduce uh, things about prismatic cohomology. So, okay. Uh, now I turn to uh, third part, so filtered prismatic Dudoné crystals. Uh, this will be the objects we will use to, to describe our peaceable groups. And uh, as you can guess, the definition will use uh, the prismatic side. So to state it, I, I first need uh, one observation. Uh, let's take R to be quasi-symptomic. Uh, and then the claim is that Okay, you, you have a natural morphism of topos, uh, which goes from the category of, of sheaves on uh, the prismatic side, the absolute one, mm -hmm. to, towards the category of sheaves uh, on the small quasi-asymptomic side of uh, my ring R. And if you wonder how this, uh, where does this morphism of topos come from? Well, uh, well it's defined as a composition. So uh, first of all, you observe that if you take a prism AI, so I mean, if you take some object of this prismatic side, you have a prism AI, then you can look at A mod I. So uh, it will be P complete. And the claim is that uh, this defines a, a co-continuous functor from the uh, 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 prismatic side of R towards the big quasi-systemic side of, of your ring R. And then you just restrict. Okay, but I'm, the only difficulty is checking this co-continuity of this of this functor. But uh, if you are familiar with crystalline cohomology, it's like very similar to what you do when you you go from the crystalline side to the, the etal or the risky sides. Except that here we work with something a bit more general. We work with the quasi-symptomic topology. Okay, and now what I will do is I will take my prismatic uh, structure sheaf or prism and this uh, ideal uh, prismatic sheaf, I prism. I just push everything using this uh, morphism V. So V was my notation for this uh, morphism of topos. Mm. I just push everything down to the uh, quasi-symptomic side. And then uh, I claim that, okay, uh, actually you have a natural surjection from uh, opris to, to O, uh, and I will give a name uh, to the kernel of this uh, morphism of sheaves. So O here is just the structure shift on the quasi-symptomic side. Mm. Uh, this kernel is denoted like this, so it's uh, uh, the f what is called the first piece of the Nagar filtration on the prismatic, uh, on this uh, prismatic shift opris. Uh, well, the reason for this notation is that, I mean, there is this notion of Nagard filtration of, of a prism, uh, and, well, which is defined for any, you could define it for any positive integer i. Here, I only need the first piece of the Nagard filtration. And I will just take as a definition that it, it is the kernel of, of, of this uh, subjection, which I did not explain. And then uh, a property of this is that, uh, well, because any delta ring has a Frobenius. So this shift O priest will come with a Frobenius morphism, phi. And one can check that uh, this kernel has the property that phi of the kernel, so phi of the first piece of the Nagat filtration of O priest, actually lies in uh, I priest times O priest. Mm. So morally on this first piece of the Nagat filtration, uh, the Frobenius is divisible by uh, well, let's say the local, uh, lo locally I is, uh, the ideal is generated by a non-zero distinguished element. And uh, the idea is that on this uh, first piece of the Nagar filtration, phi is divisible by this, uh, by this distinguished oh, element. This question from Yeah, there's a question. Uh, 
Mm. I cannot hear. Oh, can, can, can you put the microphone on? You should activate his. Uh, Takeshi, can you unmute him? Ah, yeah, now his microphone must be on. Oh. Internet, I don't. Ah. Oh, yeah, now you can speak. So, uh, why do you write I praise times O praise? I think I praise is an ideal in O praise. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's a typo. Yes, thank you, sorry. Yeah, it's just for, because later it will appear. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, so then uh, the definition of a, a filtered prismatic diodonic crystal is, uh, uh, so let me again fix a quasi-centomic ring R. And then uh, a filtered prismatic diodonic crystal is by definition of collection a, a triple M, fill M and phi M. So M is a finite locally free O prism module. First of all, then uh, fill M inside it will be uh, some OPRIS submodule. And finally, phi of M is uh, morphism, uh, ring morphism from uh, M to M, which is uh, assumed to be uh, phi linear. Okay, where phi is the Frobenius of OPRIS. Uh, okay, very good. And then, uh, you uh, ask three three conditions on this uh, on this triple. So uh, first of all, uh, you want that uh, this uh, Frobenius phi m sends uh, fill m to i prime times m. Okay, but then uh, there is an obvious uh, O-prime submodule of m, uh, which also has this property that phi phi m of it is. Uh, lives inside i prime times m. Uh, namely, uh, consider uh, the first piece of the Nagat filtration of Opris times m. Then, uh, because of the previous slide, uh, we know that this is contained in i prime. <coughs> and so, this uh, this submodule, uh, first piece of the Nagat filtration times m, also has the property that phi of it is contained in i prime times m. And then, the second uh, axiom you uh, you have is you want that this submodule is in fact contained in field M. And once you have done this, then you know that M modulo field M uh, will be a module over uh, O pris uh, modulo the first piece of the Nagat filtration. Mm -hmm. But remember that O pris modulo the first piece of the Nagat filtration was by, by definition is just the, uh, the structure shift of the quasi-symptomic site O. So uh, M mod field M will be an O module, and you ask that it is finite locally free. And then the third condition is that the image of uh, uh, the filtration by the Frobenius is, is big enough in the sense that uh, it will generate uh, I prime times M as an O prime module. So if you are familiar with crystalline diodonic theory, again, it's uh, very reminiscent of uh, the, the usual notion of, of a diodone or filter diodone crystal. And uh, the third condition is just uh, in this setting would just be a reformulation of the, of the condition that the, uh, the filtered crystal is admissible in the sense of, of cotony. So that's somewhat just the, the obvious uh, extrapolation of, of, of this classical notion to the setting of, of, of the prismatic set. Uh, okay, and then uh, a notation is, uh, if, if R is my quasi-symptomic ring, I will denote by DF of R the category of all uh, filtered prismatic diodonic crystals over R. And the morphism are the obvious ones, namely they should be O prime linear and they should uh, be compatible with Frobenius and with the filtration. Okay, uh, and so now I can come to the uh, statements of the two Two main results we we prove. So I will fix uh, again once and for all now uh, quasi-symptomic ring R. 
uh, and let me take G to be a peaceable group over R. Uh, then uh, I can define uh, M prism of G to be X1 of a G by O prism. And here, when I write this curly X1, it's supposed to be like the local X groups uh, in the category of abelian sheaves on the quasi-symptomic side. So you, you check that your peaceable group G, by reduction to the case of finite locally free group schemes, uh, defines a sheaf, an abelian sheaf on the quasi-symptomic side. And OPRIS is also an abelian sheaf on this side. And so you can take X1 in this category. And uh, then you also define fill M prism of G to be the same thing, except that you replace O prism by uh, the first piece of the Niagara filtration on it. And then the first uh, main result is that, uh, so if, if uh, G is as before, then this triple uh, M prism G, fill M prism G and uh, Frobenius of M prism of G, which is just by definition the Frobenius coming from the uh, Frobenius uh, mm. on, the prismatic, uh, on the prismatic shift here. Uh, then the claim is that uh, this is actually an object is, uh, of this category DF of R. So this is a filtered prismatic dodonic crystal over R. And in what follows, I will denote it by uh, M prism G underline. Okay, and uh, as a remark, if, if P is zero in my ring R, so in the characteristic P situation, uh, you can check using the crystalline comparison theorem, which was uh, discussed in the first part, uh, that uh, in fact, this is just the same thing as uh, the usual functor you, you will find, uh, people have studied in, in crystalline Diodone theory, uh, which you find, for example, in the, in the book of Bertolo, Green, and Messing. So this is nothing new in, in characteristic P. Uh, okay, and then uh, uh, our second main, main result is that, uh, well, this filtered prismatic Dudonet functor, uh, underline M prism, which associates to, to G, uh, M prism of G underline, uh, it actually realizes an uh, anti-equivalence between this category of uh, BT of R, of visible groups over R, and the category DF of R, which I defined before. And as a bonus, or I mean, as a byproduct of, of the proof, uh, you actually obtain that mm -hmm. uh, the prismatic Dodonet functor G goes to M prism of G uh, is already fully faithful. But if you really want to get an equivalence of categories, so if you want to be able to describe the essential image, uh, you need to, to add the filtration in the picture. <clears throat> Okay, so now I make a, a, a few remarks about the, uh, the, these two results and about the, the way we, we prove these two results. So uh, first remark is uh, that, as I said before, in, in characteristic P, you just recover the usual functor from Diodonis theory. And uh, so in particular from the theorem two, this classification result, uh, well, you can deduce that uh, the crystalline Diodonné functor is an equivalence for all quasi-symptomic rings in characteristic P. Uh, and uh, well, this was actually already known, of course, in some cases. Uh, so if you look at LCI rings, which are uh, also excellent, then uh, fully faithfulness was proved in the end of the 90s by Toyong and Messing. And uh, more recently, Eichel Law has proved that this functor is actually an equivalence uh, when the ring is, uh, okay, Nocerian LCI uh, and uh, moreover F finite. So this means that the Frobenius is finite. And this particular implies Excel. So in, in this case, the result was, was already known. Uh, okay, then I wanted to <clears throat> to explain now that this category DF of R may seem a bit uh, abstract, uh, but there is an interesting class of quasi-symptomic rings for which you can make it more explicit. Uh, namely, uh, you will say that the ring is, is quasi-regular semi-perfectoid, if it is quasi-symptomic, of course, first, and uh, then 
you also want that there exists a perfect ring which maps subjectively onto R. So it has to be big enough. And examples of such uh, in, the, in the list of examples I gave before, well, you can look at any perfected ring is obviously uh, because we know it's quite asymptotic and the second condition is is trivial. Uh, any perfected ring will be quasi regular semi perfectory but also like a, a quotient of such a ring by, by a finite regular sequence, which has bounded P infinity torsion. So these are examples of such rings. Uh, and well, for such rings, it's like for perfect red rings in the example we saw. Uh, in fact, the cotangent complex after P completion is just sitting in degree minus one. And uh, for this reason, you can check using Hodge-Tech comparison that for such a ring, uh, the prismatic site has a, has a nice feature that it admits a final object in this case, which you can just describe as if you want the, the, the absolute prismatic homology uh, with it's, it's, uh, um, it comes with a natural idea. And uh, then also you can check in this case that uh, if you take uh, the first piece of the Naga filtration on this prism to be just the inverse image of I by, by Frobenius, uh, then the quotient uh, is isomorphic to, to R itself. Uh, so two examples of, of, uh, of computation of, of this uh, initial object, or so final object, um, the first case is uh, if R is perfectory, uh, then this uh, final object is just given by the uh, ring A inf of R together with uh, the kernel of the theta map. So, okay. Yeah. In this case, the prism is perfect. So for is an isomorphism, so there is always some, some choice that you can work with the map theta or with its uh, Precomposition with Frobenius minus one, and then consider theta tilde. It's just a matter of convention. Uh, okay, but so that's, that's the first example. And then another example: if you take a ring which is quasi-regular semi-perfectoid and uh, with uh, p zero in this ring, then uh, this initial prism is just the same as uh, uh, a crease of R uh, together with the idea generated by p. So you can compute it in, in several situations. And then uh, we make a definition. Uh, it's very similar to the one we had before. A filtered prismatic Jordanian module over R will be a collection M, fill M, and phi M. But now I just have, instead of having uh, uh, finite locally free modules over the, the prismatic sheaf, I just have a finite locally free module over this string, prism R. Uh, a certain submodule of it, fill M, and a phi in R map, phi M, and you just ask the same exact same actions as before, but mm -hmm. now you only work with modules over this uh, ring prism R. So I won't, I won't repeat them, because I don't have much time left. Uh, but okay, so you can make this definition, and then the, the claim is that if my ring is quasi regular semi perfectoid, uh, I can, in fact, just evaluate all the objects I have on this, uh, so I should have written final, on this final object. And uh, the claim is that this gives an equivalence between the category of uh, filtered prismatic Dodoni crystals over R and the category of filtered prismatic Dodoni modules over R. So in other words, in this case, uh, you can make the category more explicit. You can just work with modules instead of working with with, Christ, with uh, this this object, uh, this category DF of R. And moreover, if, if the ring is perfectory, uh, then you can do even better. Uh, then you can even forget the filtration. So just look at the forgetful functor for this category of filtered prismatic Dodoni modules over R to uh, simply what you can call a prismatic Dodoni module, but in this case, it already has a name. Uh, people call them minuscule breakis in frag modules. And then the claim is, in this situation, it's, it's this forgetful functor is in fact an equivalence. So in other words, uh, as a special case of the CRM2, uh, you see that you, you recover the fact that for a perfectoid ring, uh, 
these were groups of us, such a ring are classified by minuscule Bolkis in five modules. But this is a bit cheating because uh, in fact, we need as an input uh, for the proof of CRM2, we need a special case of this. Namely, we need that uh, uh, piece of a group of our uh, evaluation ring, which is perfect to read and has algebraically closed fraction field uh, is the same thing as a, as a minuscule Bolkis in file module. Uh, and actually, it's not difficult to, I mean, you, you can deduce the case of all perfectoid rings from this uh, special case using uh, v descent argument. But so we need this as an input. Okay, uh, so can I just take five minutes to, to finish or should I stop now? Ah, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I try to finish quickly. So. Uh, I also want to mention that, uh, as I said, in general, you really need the filtration if you want to, to describe the essential image of this prismatic Dudonet functor. Uh, but I just said before uh, that in this remark that uh, for perfect red ring, uh, the filtration is actually uh, unique. So it's, it's not needed to, to state the classification theorem in this case. Uh, this is not true in general, but this also works for uh, uh, P-complete regular rings. And as an example of this, uh, just take uh, uh, the ring of integers in some uh, discretely valued uh, extension K of QP with perfect residue field. So for example, take a ring like ZP. Uh, and then uh, also this case was of course already known before. So then uh, you can prove that piecework groups over this such a ring are classified by uh, so-called minuscule Broekis in modules. And this was, this has been done by uh, Breu and Kissing, at least for all P and then extended by Kim, Lau and Liu to do all P. Uh, but we, we can also recover this, uh, namely by first proving that for such a ring, uh, you can forget the filtration and then checking that you can just evaluate on, uh, well, there is a natural uh, prism attached to to such a, a ring when, once you choose a uniformizer. It's not a final object, but still uh, you can check by uh, some reduction to the perfect situation that in this situation, evaluation on this object is again an equivalence. And so, and then we, we check that the functor we have is actually the same as the one which has been studied by Brachis in uh, all these people. But now the good point is that some of you directly land in the correct category. So, so the, class, the, the proof works uniformly for all P. You don't need to make a special argument when, when P is true. Uh, okay, and then uh, just two words about the proof. So uh, uh, for CRM1, it's not surprising. So you just follow the strategy of, of Bertolo Brin uh, and Messing in their book. Uh, so you have this definition of this triple. You want to check that uh, it is a filtered prismatic Dudonet crystal. And the idea is, well, you have to understand how, what this X one looks like. And in fact, for any group object in a topos, you have like a, some device to, to, to make computation about this X, X groups, uh, at least in low degrees. So this is explained in the, in the book of, of Bertolo Brin and Messing. And you are reduced to compute uh, some prismatic cohomology groups. So first step, you use a theorem of Renault to, to reduce to the case of piece of groups, which comes from some abelian scheme. And then via this uh, bertolo brin messing partial resolution of any group of object in Autopos, uh, what you just need to do is uh, understand precisely uh, prismatic cohomology of abelian schemes. And a key tool for this is uh, provided by the Hodge comparison theorem for prismatic cohomology. So, but the ideas are, are really similar to the one of, of Bertolo Brilmesi. And then uh, theorem two, the, the proof is, is more difficult, but uh, I just want to point that the key idea is to use uh, quasi-symptomic descent. So uh, here I introduced uh, just before the notion of quasi-regular semi-perfected ring. And a very nice feature of this site, uh, this quasi-symptomic site, which was observed by Byte, Moreau, and Scholzer, is that uh, 
uh, these quasi regular some hyperfected rings they actually form a basis of this quasi asymptotic topology or by any quasi asymptotic ring by extracting enough piece roots you can always make it quasi regular some hyperfectory and uh, this means that once you have defined this functor so once you have proof theorem one uh, then you can, to prove that it's an equivalence, you can somehow reduce to the quasi regular some hyperfected situation. And uh, then everything is more concrete, as I said. Instead of having crystals, you just have modules over this uh, ring prism R. Uh, okay, and then, oh, then, then the hard work uh, starts, but uh, uh, I wanted to say this because it shows that uh, even if you, if you want to, if you are only interested in like getting classification results over, over like Nusserian rings, uh, then the proof uh, is such that actually you, you really need to work with this big category uh, QC because the argument is, is, is very decent from, from this very big quasi regular semi perfect rings. Uh, okay. Okay, and then I will, I will skip this point. Uh, uh, I just want to, to finish by saying that there are some uh, natural uh, questions which are left uh, open. Uh, first of all, it would be interesting to see what happens for more general base rings. Right? We only prove results about uh, quasi-symptomic rings, but for example, in the work of Tsing, you, you find some results for very general periodically complete rings. Uh, but I have no idea how to to do it for more general rings. And then another thing we don't have is uh, something like deformation theory in this setting. So for this prismatic Dudonet functor. So for the usual crystalline Dudonet functor, you have this Gotenic missing deformation theory, which is very powerful. But here, uh, we don't have any analog of this. And then finally, uh, final remark is uh, more anecdotal, but uh, it's about the case of perfect rings in characteristic P. Uh, I just want to point that in this case, uh, well, because if you live over like a, an object of the prismatic side of such a ring R, uh, it will be P torsion free in particular. So uh, you can always map this prismatic structure shift on this side to the, same thing where you invert P and take Q to be the quotient of this, uh, of this in injective map. And then you check that, well, in this situation, the, uh, the prismatic Dudonet module of, of any P0 group G is in fact the same thing as home from G uh, to uh, the push forward to the quasi-symptomic side of this uh, uh, shift on the prismatic side. I mean, this is just, obtained by looking at the associated long exact sequence. And then the natural question is uh, whether the, I mean, Fontaine has, was the first to give a general definition of the Dudonet module uh, over such a perfect ring of characteristic P. And the definition looks a bit similar, except that uh, have, instead of this mysterious uh, push forward here, you have this shift of uh, Vitko vectors. And so it would be also interesting, and um, we did not do it, to uh, to know how to relate this, uh, this object here to, to Fontaine's original definition of the Dudonet functor with Vitko vectors, but without using the general crystalline comparison theorem, which of course implies this comparison, but just uh, directly uh, using the two definitions. Uh, okay, so I'll stop here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for the interesting lecture. So are there uh, any questions? Yes, uh, Luke. Could you unmute him? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but it doesn't work. I don't see Maybe why. Luke, could you unmute yourself? Luke, uh, can you put the microphone on? I, I can. I... Ah, so yeah. Now you can hear me. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So uh, I think um, you skipped uh, one of the last uh, slides where you 
you were writing something about classification of finite locally free uh, commutative group schemes. Uh, uh, you discussed uh, p divisible groups. I, I presume that you, uh, but presumably you can also classify uh, truncated BTs and maybe more general. Uh, yes, yeah, so that is the uh, finite locally free schemes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't hear you well. Okay, so uh, it was just that I wanted to see this slide again. Yes. Yeah, okay. but, yes. but then, uh, is it in terms of um, a module or rather a complex, maybe? Uh, okay, so we only do it for our perfect weight rings. Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, the idea is, to, is the same as the one you find in, in, in the paper of, of Kissing, uh, where actually you use uh, the fact that you can just like, identify uh, the category of finite lo locally free group schemes with the category of like two terms complex of Pittsburgh yeah. groups with uh, an isogeny between uh -huh. them. Um, and uh, the only difficulty in general for general quasi-syntomic rings is I'm not sure by which kind of objects you would uh, classify finite locally free group schemes. So for perfect weight rings, as I said, for Pittsburgh groups, you can forget the filtration. You just have this minuscule break in Farag modules. Uh, so it's not difficult to guess what, uh, which kind, by which kind of objects you will classify uh, finite locally free group schemes. So mm -hmm. it will just be a module of your ring prism R, which is just a inf of R in this case, uh, of projective dimension less than one, killed by a power of P, with a Frobenius on the Vershibu. Mm -hmm. But in the general situation where you should also take the filtration into account, I'm not sure how to, uh, to describe mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the locally free group schemes. So that's why we only did it for perfect weight rings. And actually this was already known mm -hmm. in all cases, except maybe when P is two by work of, of Lau. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had another question. You mentioned uh, uh, work uh, by Tsink. So is there a relation between uh, displays and this theory? Uh, yes, this is another slide I had to skip uh, here. Um, so, uh, okay, let, let me take R again to be, one, first one reduces to the case of quasi-regular semi-perfect weight rings by quasi-symptomic descent. Uh, and then, uh, well, you have this natural map from prism R to R, whose kernel is uh, the first piece of the Nagat filtration on, on this prism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a map of, of delta rings. Oh, mm -hmm. Sorry, it's a map of rings. Mm -hmm. uh, but I said that the forgetful functor from delta rings to rings uh, has a right adjoint, which is the bit vectors functor. Yes. So this map induces a map of delta ring from prism R to W of R. And using this observation, uh, you can actually check that you have a functor from our category DF of R, filtered prismatic Jodonnet modules, to uh, the category of displays over R in the sense mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, It's not an equivalence. Uh, I mean, the classification of Zinc is both more general and more restrictive. It's more general in the sense mm -hmm. that I think it only assumes a ring to be periodically complete, mm -hmm. but then he has to restrict to formal feasible groups. Because when P is two, there are like some difficulties usually. So this this is due to the fact that this functor we get from DF of R to displays of R is not an equivalence, but but it is when you restrict to nilpotent objects well, mm -hmm. in the terminology of Zinc. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, then over. Okay. So I remember the concerning this. Uh, a work on the Odonet theory, there were some, after Tsing, there were in particular some papers of Lau where he, I think he looked at, uh, for example, complete uh, mixed characteristic uh, notarian local rings with uh, residue field, either perfect or not perfect. Then he gets some, um, using Tsing, he get, I mean, he gets, he does things with, with using uh, windows and frames. So he get a very simple linear algebra things which classify p divisible groups over mixed characteristic regular rings, but sometimes he needs to, to assume it is a, 
the result is different and the residue field is not perfect. I remember. But in any case, he has some, do you get a relation between what you do and his theory? But maybe there are several such references. I don't uh, remember exactly. But I, I remember it's quite simple, like you only need to give, uh, uh, I mean, you write the R as a quotient to formal series over a coin ring, and you just have to give to uh, some yes. uh, finite free modules and some maps with composition equal to the equation or something like this. So is it possible to relate it to your... Uh... Uh, yes, uh, as that's what I mentioned here. So. Uh, as I said, in, in, for, for such uh, uh, p-complete regular rings, uh, this uh, the filtration is also not relevant. So you can describe everything. Uh, I think, as I said, uh, using Cohen theorems, you can uh, uh, get a natural prism uh, attached to this situation. So, for example, in the simple case where R is just OK, yes, uh, you just take this poikisin prism. So you just take like. Uh, uh, the width vectors of the residue field, uh, double bracket uh, uh, u for some formal variable u, and um, e is some Eisenstein polynomial, which is like determined by, after you choose a uniformizer, you, you have a natural map from this frac s towards uh, your ring r, and uh, e is a generator of this, uh, of the kernel. Uh, and then, uh, yes, then, then you get a, uh, quite simple classification in this case, as modules, finite locally free modules over such a, such a ring together with Frobenius, which has a property that uh, it, uh, uh, like after linearization, it's co kernel is, uh, uh, after you invert E, it becomes, uh, the linearization becomes an isomorphism, the linearization of Frobenius. Uh, so, but for checking that the functor is really the same as the one which is uh, used in law, uh, uh, at least we checked it in this uh, in this particular case. But this is the same as the functor you, that people usually consider. But in the more general situation, I'm not sure we checked it. So there was also a technical question about uh, whether the residue field is when the residue field is not perfect. I think it needed to work like, like sync with only formal p divisible group, but maybe I don't. Do you get, uh, a, uh, do you get, is it true that there is classific, well, I don't uh, have a, uh, now. I mean, I think when, uh, when difficulty uh, that low encounters is that, uh, I mean, he, he uses crystalline Jordan theory. Yes. Uh, so somehow you have your ring R, somehow first you reduce to, to R mod P where you can use crystalline Yodone theory, but then you need to go back from R mod P to R. So you need to use Grotenik missing theory. Uh, and, but the issue is that this, uh, like this divided power structure on the ideal uh, generated by P is not important when P is two. And Grotenik missing theory only works well when the divided power structure is important, right? So I think for this reason, he, you have to do some, usually you have to do some extra work when P is two. But here somehow, I think this issue does not appear because uh, in some sense you directly, with this prismatic you don't functor, you directly land in the correct category. Like uh, again, back to this example where R is okay. Uh, in the original uh, work of, of Boy and or Kissing, uh, Actually, you, what you first do is you produce a functor from the category of feasible groups over this ring R towards a category of, uh, of filtered modules uh, over another ring that frac S, which is like the PD on, uh, P completion of the PD envelope of uh, E inside this ring frac S. And this is usually just called curly S. And then you have to do some semi-linear algebra to check that this is indeed the same as the category of minuscule Borykissin modules. But here we directly get a functor from feasible groups over R towards uh, minuscule Borykissin modules. So somehow we avoid this difficulty and that's why we don't have any uh, assumption on P. 
Mm-hmm. I, I have another small question. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe uh, uh, what is um, so you said that uh, in the definition of a prism you have a Cartier divisor. It, you can other examples where it is not globally principal. Uh, I, no, I don't know any example where it's uh, where it's not principal actually. I think all the examples are no, the, the ideals are principal. I see basically one question. Mm-hmm. Can you hear me, Ofa? Yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, does there exist any coincidence between the filtration of prismatic Dodonet crystal and the filtration on Bun G on the Farg Fontaine curve? Since Farg proposed that using chromatic filtration, one can correspond perfectly with BT1 with Bun G. One can what? Uh, correspond perfect to it BT1 with Bun G. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm just reading what is it is. BT1 is like Barsotti Tate of level one. I guess so, but I guess what, what is perfect to it BT1? Is BT1 or not perfect to it? I don't know. I don't know what it means. Maybe BT1 over a perfect to it. Okay, I don't know. But I don't know any relation with Bun G. I mean, of course. Uh, Boykis and Farg modules are related to modifications of vector bundles on the Farg Fontaine curve. But, uh, but band G is like the band G bundle, so. Yes, so I don't see. For a group, G. for a group, they do it with a. Uh, I with guess, uh, well. Uh, yeah, so Fontaine. The, the, the G, should be, G should be a reductive group or something like this, so I don't see any relation. Okay, yeah. well, if I, so it's not, a, I'm not, a, I will need more to see it in more precise form. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so, so as far as I understand, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so but in any case, you, you prove that uh, the same construction of display is canonically uh, correspond to to what you do using these functors to displays you get exactly things uh, construction which is mm-hmm. defined for more general rings right yes okay all right so yeah so then uh, this uh, partly answer because the work of Lau and Son is kind of trying to use this display to with some mm-hmm. complicated tricks to which I don't uh, okay so it's uh, and of course you get also the crystalline diodonet theory from your yes uh, as a, uh, you need to use some morphism between relating the crystalline okay but you wrote it, uh, I don't remember if you put it in the slides. Uh, uh, I just put a remark. I mean, yeah, basically you can check that the, the usual, I mean, you have this prismatic side, you have the crystalline side. Um, let's say you just push everything to, the, to this quasi-symptomic side and make the comparison there. Uh, and, and then the claim is that the, the two categories you get are actually the same. So the, for, for uh, so the rings the, the, killed by P. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. So you you get a, ah okay. I, I have to. This was. A, I mean, yeah. Basically, this follows from the this crystalline comparison theorem. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I will have to think. Uh, okay, about, very good. Not, uh, the, the slides would be online at some point. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> goodbye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, goodbye. Yeah, have a good day.